Good morning, everyone. We'll just give a few minutes for people to log on and then we'll get started. Are you connecting? Huh? Okay. My name is Katie Kelly. I am um, the training manager with the Division of Developmental Disabilities out of the Department of Human Services. Um, I have set this webinar up as a uh, kind of quick overview for all of our stakeholders within DHS. We'll be doing a quick, brief 15 minutes of each waiver, the four waivers that we have, the HOPE waiver, the ADLS waiver, the uh, Choices waiver, and the Family Support 360 waiver. Um, we are still working on the closed captioning. Um, so we will do our best to um, get that going. Please again, as Bernie suggested, mute yourself if you um, are not speaking. We also ask that you hold off questions until our Q&A session um, at the end. Um, if you are concerned about possibly forgetting it as we go through the, the webinar, which is something that I would do, please feel free to type it in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat and we will get to those questions um, when we get to the Q&A. Um, so, we will start with Caitlin Cleary out of the LTSS office, and she is going to start with the uh, HOPE waiver. Yes, hello everyone. Let me get my screen shared here. I apologize, I'm used to Microsoft Teams, so this is all foreign to me. So hopefully you can see everything that I end up sharing here. Okay. Can you hear me okay? I just like to make sure before I start rambling on and find out that people can't hear me. <laughs> we can hear you good. Okay, perfect. My name is Caitlin Clary. I am the HOPE Waiver Manager for the Department of Human Services, Division of Long-Term Services and Support. I'm gonna try to speak a little slowly. I know that you're, if you have to uh, do the closed captioning later on, try to get it as slow as possible so that I'm not going too quickly. Um, I have been in my role since March of this year. And previously I was a long-term services and supports specialist. So today I am just going to give you a brief rundown of what the HOPE waiver program is, who is eligible and what services are offered through the program. So we'll get right into it. Home and community-based options and person-centered excellence is what the HOPE waiver stands for. So that person-centered excellence, when a long-term services and supports specialist works with a consumer to create their care plan, the goal is that that care plan will be a reflection of what the individual person needs to best keep them safe while they are remaining in an independent community setting. So that's the, the main goal of our program is to keep people home, keep people out of institutionalized settings and keep them as safe as possible in that setting. So each state has a Medicaid state plan that is developed according to federal guidelines. The state plan describes the services that that state will provide for their citizens and the methods they will use to provide those services. Um, these services usually include things like doctor's appointments, medications, therapies, things along those lines. So with Medicaid waivers, states are allowed to waive some of the government mandated requirements and use Medicaid dollars to pay for home and community-based services as an alternative to institutionalization. This is granted by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Our current waiver was implemented in 2016 and there was an amendment made in 2018. 
we are currently working on our waiver renewal that's set to be implemented as of October 1st of this year. Benefits of the LTSS HOPE waiver. The main benefit of the HOPE waiver is that it allows consumers to stay in their homes and their communities longer. Um, it is cost effective since the average cost of in-home services is significantly less than the cost of long-term facilities. Um, in fact, the average cost of a HOPE waiver care plan should be about 85% of the cost of a long-term care placement. Who is eligible? A candidate for the HOPE waiver is a consumer who, if not for those home and community-based services, would more than likely end up in a long-term care facility. Consumers need to either be 65 years of age or older, or 18 years of age and older with a qualifying disability who meet both a nursing facility level of care and are also determined to be financially eligible by the Department of Social Services Division of Economic Assistance. We'll get a little bit into level of care. So to determine whether a consumer has that required nursing facility level of care that is required for HOPE waiver eligibility, um, they are reviewed by MRT or the medical review team. The medical review team is comprised of a nurse and a long-term services and support specialist. Now there is an alternate long-term services and support specialist who takes the place of this primary specialist if the consumer being reviewed is on the caseload of that primary specialist. And we do have a facet that specialists are not able to be a member of the medical review team or supervisors are not able to be a member of the medical review team. The level of care is an impartial objective determination based on information provided by the LTSS specialist. So to gather the information needed, the LTSS specialist will complete a home care assessment and submit that to the medical review team. And at that point, the medical review team may require additional information from the specialist, but that's how you get the ball rolling for eligibility for the HOPE waiver program. To meet this nursing facility level of care, the consumer must meet one of these three criteria. So not all three of them, just one of these need to be met. The first would be continuing direct care services, which have been ordered by a physician and can only be provided by or under the supervision of a professional nurse. And these nursing services need to be every 24 hours. So daily nursing is the first potential eligibility criteria for the whole waiver. The second would be the assistance of another person for the performance of any activity of daily living according to an assessment of that individual's needs. So really that's hands-on assistance um, for any personal cares, dressing, things of that nature. And then the third is a need for skilled mental health services or skilled therapeutic services, including physical therapy, occupational therapy, or speech and language therapy in any combination that is provided so that has to be at least once per week. And that includes the mental health services or any of those therapies. <clears throat> the financial eligibility is determined by DSS's uh, Department of Economic Assistance. And the requirements are that the individual needs to have income no more than 300% of SSI. Their individual resources need to be $2,000 or less. Verification of U.S. citizenship and South Dakota residence, residency is required and verification of that level of care that we just talked about. <clears throat> so the services that are provided by the HOPE waiver, um, here we have an array of services listed. You can see that some are in italics and those are available for individuals who also reside in the assisted living facility. And the services in TEAL are available under the HOPE waiver and other LTSS programs. So the eligibility might be different um, for those various programs, but they are also offered under the HOPE waiver. 
So we've got homemaker services to help people clean up their house. Um, we do maintenance cleaning, so not really the deep, deep cleaning. It's more just to maintain the cleanliness of, of their home. We have personal cares to assist in the hands-on assistance, dressing, getting in and out of bed, getting up and down from a chair. Those things are all personal cares. In-home nursing services, that can be an array of different things, um, varying from weekly, monthly, or even daily. Chore services can be provided for people who need some help, maybe with some, some chores outside of the home and their lawn. Respite care would be for those individuals who have a lot of care provided by a family member in the home and that family member might be going out um, on a vacation or have some other, some other thing that they need to go do. So we'd provide respite care during that time. Adult companion services can provide transportation, super, supervision, socialization for an individual. Adult day services can be covered by waiver along with specialized medical supplies and medical equipment. We offer emergency response systems, meals such as Meals on Wheels or the next one, nutritional supplements. Environmental accessibility adaptations would be um, the ability to, to modify an individual's home to better equip them if they need wheelchair access or widening door frames so that they're able to get in and out of where, of where they need to go to be safe in the home. The Hope Waiver also covers assisted living services. If they, if they do need that daily nursing service, that would be something that could be covered under assisted living. Structured Family Caregiving is a newer program. Um, and that would be if the primary caregiver is somebody who is of relation to the individual requ requiring care, they can be added to the Structured Family Caregiving Program. So that is where they would receive a daily stipend for the care that they already ever are providing for the individual. So it really helps them be able to focus more on that care that they're providing um, while being, well, having an oversight agency that really just helps them make sure that they're not experiencing any caregiver burnout or they know where to find resources in, in the event that that might happen. And then two newer programs, um, community transition coordination and community living home. So all of those are services provided by the HOPE waiver. So that is a very short overview of the HOPE waiver program. I know there will be time uh, for questions later. I've included my contact information here as well. Um, and here's information about how to make a referral to Dakota at Home, which is our intake line. And that would be referrals for any service under long-term services and supports, not just for the HOPE waiver, but that would be included there as well. A referral can be made via phone or email. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak about the HOPE waiver and how it benefits the state of South Dakota. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, so update on the auto caption. Um, we apologize. Um, we are unable to do, um, Julie just sent a message to, we're now getting the closed caption op option. We apologize for any convenience. Um, so we'll just move right along into Jennifer Lewis with the ADLS waiver. Okay, um, I'm Jennifer Lewis. Are you guys seeing my my screen now? Yes. Perfect. So I'm Jennifer Lewis. I'm with the Division of Rehabilitation Services. I'm the ADLS waiver manager. I've been here just over two years. The um, Assistive Daily Living Services Waiver, or ADLS as we commonly re refer to it, is a self-directed waiver operated by the Division of Rehabilitation Services. Um, self-direction is a different concept within waivers. Um, what the self-direction portion means is that the person supported is in charge of their services. Um, they hire their staff, they fire their staff, they train them, they um, kind of do a little bit of all that. So I'll get a little more into that as I go here. 
So for our eligibility, um, we are also referred to as the quadriplegic quadriplegic waiver. Um, any person who is eligible for the ADLS waiver must have quadriplegia um, or a substantial functional limitation to all four limbs. Other diagnoses that we would look at um, could be a spinal cord injury, uh, stroke, multiple scler sclerosis, or any other diagnoses that affect all four limbs. That is our main qualifying factor there. Um, the participant must be over 18 years old. They must require assistance with their activities of daily living, such as bathing, dressing, medications, um, transfers, meal prep, et cetera. They need to be medically stable. Um, this is indicating that they are safe to be at home, that they don't have any um, medical things going on that would require them to be hospitalized or in a higher level to receive care. And then they must be able to manage and self-direct their services or select a representative. So we have expanded there where if the person is not able to manage or self-direct their services, can they still help pick somebody who will help them with the managing of their staff, with the hiring of their staff, with developing, a job description. So they are able to let someone else help them with that. And then they must be SSI or Medicaid eligible. The services we offer, um, we offer personal attendant services. Personal attendant services entail bathing, dressing, range of motion, transfers, shower, um, meal prep, if the person lives independently, they could be eligible for homemaking services and other, um, other services such as meal prep or feedings. Consumer prep services is a service that is unique to the ADLS waiver. This is assistance from a provider agency to train the person on self-direction. So anytime they would have issues or concerns, if they wanted help with addressing a performance issue with the staff, they could reach out to their provider agency and review what that performance issue is, appropriate conversations, how to document that they have that conversation. Um, it's an all, all around helping them self-direct and um, run their services within the requirements of the program. Another service that's available is in-home nursing. Um, in-home nursing must be ordered by their physician and it would be um, scheduled as, as required in their care plan. So if it was weekly nursing or monthly or whatever, that requirement may be for them. We do offer respite services for the participant who is unable or unsafe to be home alone. Um, again, these services, um, a little, little different in nature. A respite worker is not required to perform any PA services such as bathing, dressing. They're more there to provide assistance and um, supervision in those times when the primary caregiver needs to be out of the home. We can also assist with specialized medical equipment and supplies. Um, a lot of items that we provide under this um, service um, fall under such as shower chairs, grabbers, um, maybe scooters or specialized cutting boards so that a person can cook or specialized eating utensils and other cooking utensils. Um, participants are eligible for an emergency response system. This system, we offer a monitored or an unmonitored system, and that is determined what, which one they get based on how their natural support network works, um, how their natural support network looks, and if their natural supports are willing to respond in emergencies or if they would benefit more from a monitored device where it would be an outside agency responding to that call, such as a fire department or ambulance or police department. 
We can do environmental accessibility adaptations as well. Those adaptations could be items such as a ramp to access their home, an automatic door opener to help with leaving their home, widening doorways, installing uh, grab bars, or different items like that. And then the last service we offer is vehicle modifications. Vehicle modifications can be completed to a participant's vehicle, vehicle or somebody who, who routinely transports them. Modifications such as adding in um, wheelchair tie down systems, ramps, lifts, um, even up to for the person who is able and wants to drive, we've been able to do hand controls and things so that they're able to transport themselves throughout their community. Um, for somebody who's interested in applying, they can contact myself by either phone or email. My information is there. They can also access our application on the DRS um, ADLS website, and that can either be mailed or emailed to myself um, to be processed. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like we'll be able to get the um, closed captioning for this um, webinar. Um, we apologize for that convenience. Um, we will work on it, though, however, for the next one, if we should ever have one. Um, good thing for us to know how to do. Um, so we will move on to Jay's Sollers, and Jay's is going to discuss um, or give you that brief overview of the last two um, waivers, uh, the last two HCBS waivers. All righty. Um, so are you just seeing like the slide, Katie? Yes, I am. Okay, so not the notes. Nope, not the notes, just the slide. Okay, thank you. All righty, uh, so my name is Jay Sollers. I'm the waiver administrator with the Division of Developmental Disabilities. And so within my role, I oversee the operations and um, regulations and compliance for both our choices and Family Support 360 Medicaid waivers. Uh, seeing as the Division of Developmental Disabilities operates to home and community-based services waivers, I like to kind of talk about uh, the division kind of as a whole and then break into each individual waiver and then uh, do a comparison of the two because there can be some confusion sometimes about what services are offered uh, through which program. So our mission at the Division of Developmental Disabilities to, is to ensure that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have equal opportunities and receive the services and supports that they need to live and work in South Dakota communities. Um, so a way in which we do that is through our two home and community-based services waivers um, that serve individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities. Uh, and the intent of these waivers is to provide services in lieu of intermediate care facilities for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So our target population um, would be individuals who meet that institutional level of care um, and without our services would otherwise receive services in an institution for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, which um, if you're familiar here in South Dakota, we do have a state funded institution, which is referred to as the South Dakota Developmental Center. And so going a little bit more into waivers, I like to kind of provide a visual of the authorities and the authorization of our program. I think it helps paint a picture a little bit of how um, states receive funding and the availability to offer these services. Um, so to start, the, the authority to operate these HCBS waiver programs um, is 
given from the federal government, which we refer to as CMS or the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And then they give the authorization to our, our South Dakota state Medicaid. Um, so they serve as an authorizing agency and our state Medicaid is housed within the Department of Social Services. Within the waivers, uh, the Department of Social Services grants the Division of Developmental Disabilities, um, the operating agency role. And so we're housed within the Department of Human Services. So essentially what that means is that uh, while the Division of Developmental Disabilities kind of oversees the day-to-day -day operations of the waivers, the actual authorities um, and agreement um, to operate these services is between our state Medicaid office and CMS as uh, these are Medicaid funded programs. And so through those agreements, the Division of Developmental Disabilities operates two home and community-based services waivers, which are Choices and Family Support 360. So talking a little bit about the eligibility for our programs, um, we do have the same diagnostic eligibility for both Choices and Family Support 360 because we're serving the same target population. And so our eligibility requirements are outlined in Administrative Rules of South Dakota. Um, but essentially what we're requiring is that an individual have an intellectual disability or a condition that is closely related to an intellectual disability. Um, so you can see here that that might include things like cerebral palsy, epilepsy, head injury, or brain disease, um, such as a seizure disorder or autism, or any other condition that's closely related to an intellectual disability. And so what it means to be closely related to an intellectual disability is that the condition that an individual is diagnosed with um, results in impairment of general intellectual functioning or IQ or adaptive behavior similar to that of an intellectual disability. So of course, this list isn't um, exhaustive. There are countless diagnoses out there that uh, may or may not meet the eligibility requirements. Um, but just in general, this is what we would see as our target population. So that would be someone with an intellectual disability or someone um, with a condition that closely resembles an intellectual disability. The key thing is that the disability has to have manifested prior to the age of 22 to be eligible for our services. So just as an example, if somebody uh, was in a car accident and, and had a traumatic brain injury at the age of 26, they would not be eligible for our programs within the Division of Developmental Disabilities. And then of course, documentation that it's likely to continue indefinitely. This rule, um, I would say talks broadly, but within our office, we also have to utilize um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Medical Disorders, which is also referred to as the DSM-5. Uh, as they are the ones that define the diagnostic requirements for an intellectual disability. Um, so we maintain the standard as it's outlined in that manual. If something were to be updated in that manual, um, that would of course have an impact on our eligibility requirements as a state. And then because we are Medicaid funded programs um, to be eligible, individuals must be receiving SSI um, and be or be determined age blind or disabled and have income less than 300% of the standard benefit amount. So then going into the waiver program specifically, we have our choices waiver. Um, the choices acronym stands for community, hope, opportunity, independence, careers, empowerment, and success. And so we commonly refer to our choices waiver as our comprehensive waiver program, um, essentially meaning that we provide a broad variety of supports, including residential supports to daytime supports uh, to support somebody in many multiple facets throughout their day. Um, the goal of that being is that we want to help individuals lead an independent, healthy and productive lives, um, promote their full right to exercise their rights as a citizen of the state of South Dakota and promote the integrity of their families. 
So our Choices Waiver Services are delivered through um, 20 community support providers and four case management providers, and we serve approximately 2,700 people through this program. Um, it is a requirement that case management services and direct support services remain conflict-free. So an individual um, cannot receive case management services from the same provider who is delivering their direct supports. So this is just a, a map that I won't go into too much detail about, but this provides an overview of our state and where our community support providers are located across the state. So you can see we have quite a few providers in the southeast, southeast region, um, but our providers stretch as far up into Lemon. Um, so we do have good representation all across South Dakota. And then the colored regions are the different regions of the state and different case management providers deliver services in those different regions. So going into our choices waiver services, the standard services being case management. So our case management services being delivered by those four case management providers. Um, just a broad overview, the intent of that is to be an advocate for the individual and facilitate the development of their person-centered plan, which allows them to access services and supports needed. The choices waiver also offers residential supports. Um, so that can be as complex as 24 hour supports and supervision, as well as intermittent supports throughout the day or throughout the week. Uh, this residential supports also includes our shared living um, service. So I, I always like to highlight that shared living is not its own independent program, um, but it is a component of the choices waiver. The choices waiver also offers day services. And so that's just intended to provide uh, our participants with opportunities to gain meaningful life experiences um, in relation to whatever goals they might have. Support employment, we offer individual and group support employment with the intent of um, providing supports to, to sustain paid employment at a, or above uh, the minimum wage in, in a competitive integrated setting. The Choices Waiver also offers a career exploration service. And so the intent of that service is to help with um, identifying skills and developing those skills to help prepare them for competitive integrated employment. Within Choices, there's a nursing service. And so that would include uh, different screenings and assessments, um, diagnosis and treatment, um, assisting with some somewhat nursing case management. So um, scheduling medical appointments, monitoring medical care, those types of things. We also have specialized medical equipment and drugs. And so similar as what you would have seen within the other two waivers, but those would be um, medical devices or appliances or things that would control, um, enable a participant to perform activities of, of daily living or control their environment. And then the last service that the Choices Waiver offers is our other medically related services, um, speech, hearing, and language, which is just the implementation of direct therapies, which are supervised by um, a licensed professional and otherwise not available through the state plan. So that's a summary of the Choices Waiver. I'll move next into our Family Support 360 Waiver. So similar to the ADLS waiver, Family Support 360 intends to provide individuals with an opportunity to self-direct services and support. So hiring, training, um, the ability to fire the staff that deliver their um, personal care and companion care type services. And so um, this uh, waiver assists with identifying, identifying both natural and paid supports with the intent of keeping their family together and supported in their home or community. And how those, that's done is each individual receiving family support services um, is, chooses a family support coordinator who helps them uh, develop an individualized plan and access the services and supports that 
family support offers. So the different waiver services that we have within family support would include support coordination. This is a similar role as case management within our choices waiver. The, we also offer respite care, which is intended to be short-term intermittent breaks uh, for primary caregivers. The next service would be companion care. And so the intent of companion care is really um, to promote whether that be um, supervised integration or socialization or role modeling uh, for independent skill development. And so this is really a kind of hands-on um, supportive type service to help individuals learn and develop skills. Whereas Family Support also offers a personal care service, which is more intended um, to help individuals accomplish tasks that would include those activities of daily living. So eating, bathing, personal hygiene type thing. We also offer environmental accessibility to include physical adaptations to the home that allow participants to function with greater independence or perform uh, different tasks without, throughout their home. We offer uh, vehicle modifications, which would be those adaptations or alterations to an automobile or van, that's their primary uh, means of transportation. Specialized medical adaptive equipment and supplies is also a service in the family support waiver. So again, that medical equipment, um, we are able to offer a, a really broad variety of supports through this service to meet the needs of our participants with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. So that would include a lot of sensory equipment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and then we also offer nutritional supplements. And so those would be products like a booster ensure that complement a participant's dietary needs that otherwise aren't covered by the Medicaid state plan. So our Family Support 360 providers, uh, you can see here, and we support approximately 1,400 people on our Family Support 360 waiver. So then I'd like to do kind of a comparison of the two waivers and just kind of highlight the different services. And so again, our choices waiver is our comprehensive waiver. Um, that is going to include our residential habilitation service, whereas Family Support 360 is our self-directed waiver. So one of the key differences that you can see between the two waivers is that Family Support 360 does not provide a residential service. Um, the intent of Family Support 360 is to support individuals who either live independently in their own home or in the home with their family. So somebody who was receiving residential level supports would not be eligible for family support. But otherwise, there are some similarities between the services that are offered. Uh, so you can see that support and employment is a common service between the two waivers. Medical equipment and drugs is a common service between the two waivers. And then obviously case management and support coordination. So determining um, which waiver might be more a better fit for an individual is going to depend on what their goals, hopes, and desires are, uh, and what types of services that they would like to receive in order to help accomplish those goals. And then just um, providing a breakdown of our provider network. So the Division of Developmental Disabilities certifies and funds 20 community support providers and four case management organizations who deliver choices waiver services. And then of those providers, uh, seven of our community support providers and one case management organization are also certified to deliver Family Support 360 and then providing a breakdown of those agencies. And so to get more information about choices in Family Support 360, um, we're excited about this new process, but individuals can speak with a DDD intake specialist by contacting Dakota at home. So that's the direct number. And then there is now the option to press two uh, for developmental disabilities, and then including uh, the Dakota at home website.
And that is it. Thank you ladies for those brief overviews. Um, I always love it when we're ahead of schedule. Um, so we will just go ahead and jump right in with questions. Um, we, we do have one in the chat box. Um, Jay, can you please address the supported employment services, what they look like under um, each waiver? Sure. Um, so when it comes to, I guess, comparing support employment between family support and choices, probably one of one of the key differences is that within our choices waiver support employment services that there's that group option. Um, so an individual could be receiving those support employment services in a group um, and, and accomplishing employment related goals related to that. Whereas individual support employment and family support is um, individual specific. But otherwise, the, the services across the two waivers are going to look very similar. So it's that um, job discovery and then otherwise support to maintain competitive integrated employment. Um, that, but the service definitions read very similar between the two. And so um, that could include, you know, on the job support um, and kind of oversight to help an individual maintain successful within their um, current position, as well as kind of that discovery piece of identifying um, what their, their dream job is um, and the supports necessary to achieve that. So I hope that answers that question. Thank you. And that was from Katie Graham. Um, we have another one from Jennifer Trenhill. Can you provide more information about the shared living program and how the supports for residential, day services, and employment are provided? So, Jay's, that's you again. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, our shared living program, uh, there are specific providers within our, our 20 certified community support providers that also offer shared living as a service. Uh, and so within that service, there is particularly, I guess, a level of matching. So finding um, a, an individual and a provider with whom the individual wants to um, share their life with, essentially. And, and then the residential service piece of that looks like that. Um, the participants and their shared living provider share that home together and provide the necessary supports. Um, to help an individual maintain their level of independence and accomplish their goals. Um, when it comes to what an individual in shared living's day might look like, um, that will vary on the specific needs of that per person or participant. And so someone who is receiving a shared living residential service might also attend day services at one of our community support providers. Uh, as they could also attend um, or receive supported employment type services, but it would all be very individual specific. So when we look at shared living, uh, we are looking at the, the fact that it's a residential component within the choices waiver. And that means that, that the home that they're sharing and the services that they're receiving while they're in the home. Um, but when it comes to additional services that a shared living uh, participant might receive, that would look, um, those services would look the same that, that anybody else would be receiving in our choices waiver. I think there might be more questions here. Thank you. Um, Marva Jones, what is the starting point for a family with a child with developmental disabilities who has not yet applied for services or benefits? Yes, yeah, so we are um, at this point in time recommending that if a family has more questions about um, either choices or family support 360 or just anything that the division has to offer that they start by contacting our DDD intake specialist uh, through that Dakota at home phone number. We also have an email which I should have included, but I can include that before the PowerPoint gets distributed if that's okay, Katie. Um, yes, Megan Hulse, we, um, we are happy to 
share PowerPoint presentations. Um, I have a quick question. Um, is there services within each division that can be utilized even if somebody is on a waiver um, or across divisions? Um, so for example, if somebody is on um, the choices waiver, they can still receive voc rehab services. Um, are there other services like that in, in other divisions um, that we could work together potentially on a, on a mutual client? I'll start, and if anybody wants to, um, any of the other waiver managers want to jump in. So because our participants are eligible for Medicaid, that means that they're eligible to receive the services that the Medicaid state plan offers. Um, as long as there's no conflict or duplication of what is, is uh, being offered. So it can be possible that somebody on, I'll just speak to Choices or Family Support 360, uh, could also be eligible to receive Medicaid state plan services um, that are authorized by the Division of Long-Term Services and Supports, which would include um, state plan personal care homemaker and nursing services. So to broadly answer your question, yes, it's possible. It is very individualized because we do have to look at the level of services and supports that somebody is receiving and make sure that there isn't a conflict between the two, which is, is similar to how we are authorizing or making referrals uh, between vocational rehabilitation and our employment services. Um, so that would be my answer to that question. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd say an individual cannot be enrolled in two programs at the same time um, in two different waivers, but they can utilize some services that that Medicaid state state plan does offer. Another question in the chat box. Thank you, ladies, for answering that. Um, another question in the chat box. Bernie is asking, can a person under 21 be on the DDD waiver? Yes. Uh, so, and I realized that was something I didn't highlight within our target population. It's both choices and family support. Uh, 360 have the ability to serve individuals across the lifespan. So um, technically our age range is zero to end of life. However, when um, an individual under the age of 21, uh, in both cases, but particularly with our choices waiver, there becomes additional requirements due to um, IDEA and school district funding. And so that essentially to be able to receive supports through uh, choices or Family Support 360, the, the responsibility of the school district to provide those services and supports has to be ruled out. So that has some funding impl implications. Um, but otherwise, that is the, the age range that we serve on both of those programs. I would say that our Choices Waiver more serves more adults, whereas our Family Support 360 waiver serves more children. Jay, so uh, just a follow up on that. So who would take the lead in those uh, individuals cases? Would it be the special ed teacher, the school, or would it be the case manager funded through the waivers? Yeah, so when it actually comes down to the, the funding components of uh, what we refer to as kids under 21, that is a, a conversation that happens within the, the IEP team because those funding requirements um, have to get discussed down at that level with the, with the school district. Um, so that, that's typically a, a team discussion that happens at that level. Thank you. Uh, Kate Didi asks, what would be the advantage for someone on a service like family support, but who has significant medical or physical disabilities to move to the HOPE or ADLS waivers as an adult? Okay, I'll start again and then probably ask again for somebody else to chime in. The the family support waiver with it being um, self-directed, again, it, I would say our average cost on family support annually for participants uh, is about 
$5,600 a year, so it has a, a relatively small fiscal impact. There are some limitations when it um, talks about the number of hours or services that we could provide on family support. And so um, sometimes somebody might have more medical needs and supports that would exhaust um, what is available within family support. One of the things that I would highlight is that family support doesn't offer a nursing service as an example. So if somebody needed nursing level of services, um, that might be a time when they would explore different service options simply because that's not something that we can, can provide. Um, but otherwise, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. It's mostly the scope of service. Um, yeah, you said it's 5,600 a year the hope waiver offers that monthly so we have a significantly larger amount that we can approve each month and we do have that nursing service so that does occasionally happen if if there is decline um which the individual is no longer able to be supported on one of the other waivers they may come to the hope waiver when they are of that age if they need that more daily care with the nursing involved And this is Jennifer. In addition to that, um, the ADLS waiver limit is 50 hours a week of PA services. So that's substantially higher than both programs. If a person would need that level of medically necessary services and were eligible, um, I could see that being a good reason to switch. Hopefully that answered your question, Kate. Um, I don't have any more questions in the chat box. Um, feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask any questions that you may have. Hi, this is Teresa with RHD. Question, kind of what you guys were just talking about. I've run up against this a couple times. So say someone wanting to be on choices for maybe very limited services some social services, maybe through like a level three residential, um, but not going to get enough nursing services from a community support provider. Can then, is there then an option to receive nursing services through long-term services and supports to then suffice what the person needs because they can't get that social part from the hope waiver that they're needing? Is there a possibility there? Yeah, so that would touch on kind of what we were discussing earlier about the possibility of somebody can't be on two waivers at one time, for example, but they can't access those Medicaid state plan services while they're on a waiver. And so there might be, and it's very individualized uh, when it comes to that level of review on if those services and supports are appropriate or not. And it's going to depend on what's in the participant's ISP and what supports that they're receiving from their community support provider. Um, but there would be a possibility for someone to receive state plan, personal care, homemaker, or nursing services while they're also on the choices or family support waiver. Who, how would we go about doing that then, Jay's like, who, what entity, say this person is not in services at all yet. How do you just get that clarified and decided so they know? Yeah, so right now we collaborate between uh, DDD and LTSS, so they're typically to authorize those LTSS services, they start with Dakota at home, and then there is communication that occurs between LTSS and DDD to make sure that those services are appropriate. Yeah, so that's- Should they apply with, who should they apply with first? <laughs> I guess is the question. Good question. <laughs> I mean, probably both, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, what, I get, and what's going to vary is if the, the person is already um, on SSI and receiving those Medicaid funded supports, because then they would otherwise, if they meet the level of eligibility for that state plan, personal care, homemaker services, they could access that because they're a Medicaid recipient. Um, whereas, of course, there's a process to apply and get on the choices waiver. So it's also going to depend on what their need is now um, and what their their current status is, I guess, for lack of a better word. But to Caitlin's point, you would you could probably start the processes simultaneously. 
Yeah, and Dakota at home, especially now with that addition to be able to go over to DD by the press of a button from that from that service, the intake specialists there are trained to know maybe what the best route would go and how to get you in contact with the person who um, you should maybe start with. I think I am the start with person. So I was just curious then when we send the paperwork, how to make it clear that this person is wanting both and then how do you make that collaboration happen? Sure. You know, I guess that would, so that would be two referrals to Dakota at home now, now that that new service is added. So yeah, a new, a new referral to Dakota at home just to eliminate anything because it is an individualized situation. It's not going to be one answer to, e to every question. So that's where I'd start. Hey, Caitlin, it's Jen Lewis. Um, the Dakota at home, is that, is there two different forms on the website now for doing an online referral? I don't believe so. I believe that it's just that button that you push to go over to speak with somebody in DD, but the actual referral process has not changed for LTSS. Perfect, thank you. Jeannie Morris graciously put the email address for the DDD intake specialist in the chat. Um, feel free to copy and paste that. Um, we will also have that with the PowerPoints as well. Um, are there any other questions? All right, if there are no other questions, um, we all get 30, day, 30 minutes back in our day, just in time for lunch <laughs> for some of us. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to your assigned program specialist or your DHS liaison that you have. Um, Everybody have a great day. I don't know if it's raining where you're at, but if it is, stay dry. If it's not, enjoy the weather. Thanks, Katie. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everyone.